Hear now the word of the Lord. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless the reading and the preaching of his holy word. Amen. Well, if you'd please just ask the Lord to send his spirit to be with us this morning, especially with me, um, that we would be able to proclaim the excellencies of Christ this morning, that we ponder these things and that they would reshape our thinking for 2021, that we would be thinking rightly uh, how we are enjoined union in union with Christ. So would you please just pray right now that God would send his spirit to attend to all that we do to the receiving and the preaching of his word this morning. Father, as we join together in prayer, I thank you for your people. Lord, I thank you for what we bring before you this morning in praise, Lord, to exalt Christ and to glorify you. The proclamation, Father, of all things in this text this morning before us, that we ascribe glory to you, that we ascribe to you the power that is due your name and what you have done through the cross and through the gospel. So, Father, I thank you for the time you give us this morning to make the proclamation, to ponder the truth of it, and Lord, to praise you. Father, we exist to give you praise and glory and honor. We exist, Father, to be a proclamation from age to age and from every wave that hits on the beaches, Father, from one to the next, Lord, that we would be those who praise you. We would be those who proclaim your excellency. So I ask, Father, please, this morning that you would set aside our sin, Father, that you would forgive us, pardon us our sin this morning, that we would have a clear conscience before you this morning to receive your word and, Lord, to empower us, Father. We ask for the power of your spirit, that the spirit which you put within us, Father, to rightly understand, to rightly live our lives, and, Lord, to look to you for all counsel and wisdom in all things. So, Father, please, I ask, Lord, that you would do that for me right now. Father, I need your assistance to proclaim the greatness of what you have done. But God, what a thing to fathom, Father. We can just sit there and, and dwell on that for an eternity. But God, look what God has done. Oh, please, Father, I just ask that you would bless. I want to be a servant of Christ and a steward of your message this morning, empowered by your spirit to do so. So would you please bless us, Lord, with the attending of your spirit and all that is done. May you be glorified, Father, as we lift up Christ before one another. So I ask for your blessing, for your glory, and for, oh, our good. Please, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, how many of you have Encyclopedia Britannica's at home right now? Some of you, some old school, yeah, all the homeschoolers, right? All right? Okay, how many of you have it like online, have electronic versions of Encyclopedia Britannica online? Uh, and everybody's like, yeah, I can, I mean, you can Google it, right? You can just Google it. Do you know what Encyclopedia, I just found this out the other day, and for some reason that popped into my mind, so I've got to share this because I just find this astounding, right? Because in the text this morning, we're seeing the but God. We're seeing this, this huge acknowledgement of what God has done. We're saying, you can't step around this. You have got to destroy the text of Scripture to not recognize what God has done in your salvation. You have got to malign this. You've got to twist it. You've got to shape it. You've got to do everything you can to, to keep God from just blowing up on the page. Encyclopedia Britannica is doing the same thing right now. They no longer want to call it B.C. and A.D. They want to call it basic common era and common era. Why? It's still 2021. You can't get around it. Unless you're going to change the date of 2021 to something else, you can't get around the fact that we tell time by the birth of Christ. You can do the B.C., A.D., Elemental, P, Q, R, S, T, whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. You cannot silence the truth of who Christ is. You can't silence God. He is displayed in everything around us, in every bit of creation. He is there. He will get the glory. He will get the acknowledgement. And we will say to it, but look what God has done. But God. But God. But God did it all. But God created us. But God created us in his image to glorify him. We exist for the glory of God. Amen? Okay, let's go. We're done.
No, I got 35 more minutes. Hold on. This is an amazing text. Who is the one who wrote this? Think about this. I, I'm very thankful for what John did while I was gone. He brought up to us Paul. He, he said, do you know the one who wrote this text? Do you know the one who, who put this together? Inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm not speaking heresy. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote this. Who would know better that little two words, but God? What was Paul doing on the road to Damascus? Paul was a mass murderer. Paul was killing Christians. Paul thought he was serving God. Paul thought on his own strength and his own wisdom. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, born on the eighth day, circumcised. All the things you see in Philippians that Paul donated, basically says, if anybody could do it, I can do it. He was doing it on his own strength. Oh, that you would not think that you can do it on your own strength this morning. Oh, that you would give glory to God and say, I can't do it. You've got to do it. We resist the grace of God all the time. In the tulip, the I stands for irresistible grace. To rightly understand what irresistible grace is, to rightly understand that we resist God's grace. You were resisting God's grace in verse 1, 2, and 3 of this chapter. We once were formerly resisting the grace of God, and he had to break our resistance. That's why I titled this, Breaking Our Resistance. God has to come in, but God breaks our resistance to him. When we sin, guess what you do? When we sin, when we do something that we want to do, we break or we put up a resistance against God's grace. We're saying, no, God, I got this. I can handle this. I can resist this. But look what Paul says in verse 4. But God, but God, but God knocked me off my horse. But God opened my eyes. After he blinded me first, he opened my eyes to see what I would have to suffer for him. He does that to us every single day. He knocks us off our high horse. Anybody ride horses in the room? Anyway, Clydesdales are pretty cool, aren't they? They're way big, right? They scrape the barn when they go in. I don't think he was riding a Clydesdale, but a horse is good enough. I've never been knocked off a horse, and I have no desire to even get on one. My son does horses and cows and everything else. That's fine, great. Do whatever you want to do. I have four-wheeler, sure. Motorcycle, sure. Not a horse. Paul gets knocked off his high horse. Paul wouldn't have known clearly, but God. But God did this, but God did this, because Paul would have said, I was dead in my trespasses and sins in which I formerly walked according to the course of this world. He would have said that. According to the course of the world, I'm gonna go kill Christians. According to the course of the world, I went to the the council and I got letters to go up and to pursue them, Damascus. According to the course and philosophy of the world, now put it into contemporary terms. How many of you ever heard somebody say, I'm not gonna come to Christianity because I wanna do what I wanna do. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to be under the law. I don't want to be under the confinement of what Christianity has. You guys are all about rules. You guys are all about this. This is the law. Do the law. Or you're going to go to, you put in the word there. You know what it is. I want to be free. I want to be free to do whatever I want to do. Unfortunately, that thinking is right here. According to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, you're never free. You're never free. The individual who says they want to be free and they don't want to come to Christianity or whatever they say, they're not free. They're following the course of the world. They think they're free, but they're listening to the paradigms and the thoughts of the world. That's what they're doing right now. That's why the world is doing it, following after the sin of the world. The thoughts, the ideologies, the paradigms, whatever you want to call it, that's what the world is doing right now. That's where they're going. That's why it's going down, down, down. Now, Remember I said this several months ago. If the, if the society around us is going down, 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 is the, er, is the church rising up? Is the church, even if we just held ground, even if we just hold the ground of the gospel, if we were to just say this is the gospel, we don't have to be theologians, we don't have to be, even if we just hold on to that and somebody, thank you, if we just hold on to that, we should be rising above. If the, if the community around us, if the world around us is going down, 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 following after the paradigms, the church should be rising up. We should be shining brighter and brighter and brighter each and every day. But if we follow our own course, then we're back in this. We're back where Paul Paul had us yet last week. According to the prince of the power of the air who puts those things out there, of the spirit that is working in the sons of disobedience, among them, we too. Notice that there's a we there in the section we're looking at today, the four through seven. He also will say we He's basically putting himself in the boat. Remember last week I said, get in the boat with the other people around you when you're presenting the gospel? Get in the boat and say, I once was there. I once followed the course of this world. I once was a selfish, dirty, rotten, okay, some farm animal. 
right there. I was there. I was there. I know exactly what that was. I wanted everything for me. And sometimes I still do that. Sometimes I think, what is in it? what's in it for me? Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind. We thought the things first, and then we engaged in them. And we're by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Remember I said last week, be careful about this prince of the power of the air. Look at the internet. How many of you are looking on the internet and going, oh, we need to get this, this, and this in order because the world's coming to an end? I hear it from a lot of Christians around me. It's like everybody's got these conspiracy theories going on. I'm like, where'd you get this information? Well, the internet, of course. I'm like, what does this say about that? What does the word of God say about being afraid? We're doing those things because we're afraid. Okay, now I have to be honest with you. I'm gonna go buy a case of bottled water and put it in my garage this afternoon because there's prudence too, right? I should have some supplies on hand in case a storm hits, but I'm certainly not gonna dig a hole in the ground. You ever watch the preppers? They're amazing. They dig these big tunnels under the ground and put all this stuff in there. Why in the world do you wanna live in that thing? For 50 years, why the nuclear fallout and everything. I want to die, man. I want to be in Ezekiel where my body and my flesh just <laughs> rip right off of me. My bones don't even touch the ground. That's great. I'm ready to go, man. If that's the way we go, boom. I see Seattle going up in smoke. I'm like, praise the Lord. I'm about to see my bones, you know? Fear what? Why are we in fear? That's the, the world around us is in fear right now. The world around us right now is in fear. Fear, 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 fear. They're functioning from fear. That's Satan's. That's, this, that's what's in verses one, two, and three of this text. Paul would say, guys, that's verses one, two, and three. Did you not read this? Hello? That's, that's there. Don't fear. You've got no reason to fear because God has done something. Because, but God, but God broke down your resistance. But God took away the fear but God took away all these things that could could cause you to have anxiety. God took away these things. He took them away through the cross, but God. We could just sit there forever, couldn't we? But God, but God Almighty, but God Almighty reached down and opened your eyes, saved you, gave you the grace. And that's according to this, being rich in mercy. Wow, being rich in mercy because of who he is. Remember back up in the other part there? It says, by nature. Look at verse three. It says, and we're by nature children of wrath. By nature, you were born into it. By nature, you were born into sin with no hope of salvation unless God opened your eyes. But God being rich in mercy because of who he is being, his existence is merciful. How many of you look at God like he's wrathful? The world looks at God like he's a wrathful God. That's a perspective that we're going to look back in the Old Testament. That's a perspective from the Old Testament. How many of you think the Old Testament, the God in the Old Testament is just this, Rah! and oh, I love Jesus. He's in the New Testament. So let's just get rid of the Old Testament and love the New Testament. Please don't do that. There is probably more grace in the Old Testament than in the New, believe it or not. When you look at the persecution and the things that go on in the New Testament, there is more mercy and love and grace and kindness from a covenant-keeping, faithful God. In the Old Testament, that's explained in the New, and there's more yuck in the New. Being rich in mercy, God's presence, who he is, he's merciful, merciful. But God being rich in mercy, because, according to, for this reason, this is the cause of it. Why is he rich in mercy? Because of a love, because of his great love, his mega love with which he loved us. The love that he has for his son, he's loved us with. We are in Christ the same way he loves Christ to most degree. Christ is very unique though. I don't wanna be heretical here. Christ has a unique office. Christ is the son of God. But we enter into that love. We enter into that. So being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, the beloved. Remember I told you this a while ago. You're the beloved. You're the being loved. You're the ones that are being loved by God. And to do that, he puts you in Christ, gave you all the spiritual blessings of that. He demonstrates his power in you as he did at the resurrection of his son. Back in verse 19, 20, and 21, There's an emphasis here. There's an implication that Paul is drawing on that understanding that the power that God used to raise his son from the dead is now present in your life. Think about that. The power that you have right now by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit 
is the same power that God the Father raised the Son from the dead. Can you do anything? The answer is yes. I'm not trying to, trying to, think, not trying to be wacko here. You have that power residing within you. You have the power of God residing within you. Do you have anything to fear? How many of you are going to go big a, dig a tunnel this afternoon and put all your groceries in it? Hopefully nobody. Get a couple cases of water. You should have water on hand. I've got some dry foods and stuff like that. There's no fear. No, no fear. COVID comes, it takes life. COVID goes. But God being rich in mercy. Let's take a look at this. I want, I want to lay a couple things before you. So first was Paul, but God. But God. And we have to understand the breaking of our resistance this morning. And so Paul, again, in, in the book of Acts, he's knocked off his horse. And he understood what this but God meant. He understood that God did this to him. He would have never found this. But how do we understand irresistible grace? How do we understand God breaking us and, how, and our inability? I want you to turn with me to John 6. Last week I mentioned a couple of things. We didn't get to John 6, and that's by God's providence. Guess what? It fits better this text of Scripture this morning than it did last week. So guess what? Let's go to John 6. Let's see Jesus again saying, truly, truly. Do you guys remember what I said about truly, truly last week? Jesus says this comes up a little bit higher. This comes up as a little bit more important. Every word that Christ speaks is the word of God. Everything in the, in, in the word of God, everything that we see here, vo- verbal, plenary, uh, text of scripture every word is inspired by God but there are things that rise up a little bit higher he says truly truly three times in this section join me in John 6 verse 26 let's look at his teaching here I want to explain some things that Paul again is not pulling things out of his hat he's basing this on Jesus's instruction to us and we need to understand this says Jesus answered them and said he's in Capernaum talking to the Pharisees he says truly truly I say to you you seek me but because you saw signs Not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. They're looking for a welfare community. They're looking for a sandwich. Where's the free sandwich? Anybody get a free sandwich this week at Subway? No, you paid for something. You usually usually buy seven sandwiches and you get the eighth one free or whatever. There's no free sandwich. They're looking for a free sandwich. 27, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, For on him, the Father, God, has set his seal. Amazing. Set the seal of God. The Holy Spirit has been placed upon him. Therefore, they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? They want to know what I got to do to be saved. What do I need to do? Remember the rich young ruler, he came to Jesus. I've done everything. What do I need to do? Have you asked yourself that? What do I need to do to be saved? How do I get saved? What do I need to do? Jesus' answer is clear here. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. You believe in Jesus Christ. How many of you are able to do that? Now, some people grow up in Christian homes. Some people grow up in Christian homes and they go off to summer camp and they get saved when they're eight or nine or 10. Anybody have that experience? I always ask those people, I said, so when did you really get saved? I've been to summer camps. I've seen what happens out there. I've seen you, you get these kids all hyped up on, on candy bars and soda, right? And then on Saturday, they make a profession of, or on Friday, they make a profession of faith. You baptize them. And then they go off. They come back the next year. They do it again, right? They do it again. So when people come to the church and they want to ask, they ask for membership, I said, when did you get saved? Oh, at summer camp when I was eight. I said, so what's the gospel now? What's the gospel right now? Can you, can you make this profession? Can you show me that you believe in the Son of God? Not that you had something then, but you've got it now. Every single day, the gospel is something that you think about, you contemplate, you ponder, you think about. It rules your life. He says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what then do you do as a sign so that we may see and believe you? They don't believe. They don't believe him. They don't believe this one who's manifested himself in front of him. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread to eat to, from heaven, from out of heaven to eat. Jesus said to, said to them, truly, truly, there it is again. Truly, truly, I say to you, this is above what you're thinking. This is above the text of scripture. Understand this, this is the truth. Truth of truth. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who, gave, who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread. You can't believe in me. I come down out of heaven. I've come here. I've manifested myself to you. I've already done enough signs to where you should understand this and you still ask for a sign. It's because your, are, your ears are hardened. Your eyes cannot see. I am the bread of life. Who comes, down, who comes down to me will not hunger. Now he who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. But I say, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. If it were by works, you'd believe. If it was by your own inclination, if it was by your own thinking, if it was by your thoughts and processes, you would believe. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Oh, all that the Father gives to him will come to me. Did you come to Christ? The Father gave you to Christ. What a beautiful picture. Think about that. If you have faith in Jesus Christ right now, if you know your penal substitutionary atonement. Can you guys articulate penal substitutionary atonement? I do that to people, and I shouldn't do that, but I, I mean that way. All that the Father gives me will come to me. You came to him because the Father gave you to the Son. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. What a beautiful picture of his humanity and his deity right there in that statement. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing. Can you lose your salvation? No, but you had to have been given to the Son by the Father. All that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Future, that resurrection. Therefore, the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. Here's where it gets, this is the part you underline. I had to do all that to get you to 44. Underline 44. No one can, no one has the ability no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Yeah, that's an invitation, right? How many of you heard the invitation? Hey, come to church and try church for 40 days. Come to Jesus and try Jesus for 40 days. We know you'll love him. Thank you for the silence. I hope you would kick me out of the pulpit if I ever said that. Um, that's, just, that's just tragedy. That's just heresy. That's just wrong, okay? I don't know how else to say that. That's wrong. But guess what? That's popular, that is popular. Just come try Jesus. Oh, you're single. We have a singles group. Come to our singles group. We have a young married. Come on. We have a group for you. We have this for you. We have this for you. Come and try Jesus for 40 days. That's how some people would like to define the word draws. Some people define that word that way. That word is a summons. That word rightly understood is a summons by God. When you're summoned by God, what can you do? If God summons you to come to him, what can you do? Can you resist him? That's irresistible grace. That's what we understand. He breaks your resistance to him because you were like Ephesians 2, 1, 2, and 3, dead in your sins and trespasses, an enemy of God, a rebel of God. Have you ever thought about that? You were an enemy of God. You were like Paul on the road to Damascus. You were just like him. Had you had the credentials, you would have done what he did. He was out killing Christians because he thought they were opposed to what he thought God was. People want to have their own view of what God is these days. Cyclopedia Britannica, when you look at their little thing, they said, we don't want Christianity to hold sway. Huh. Well, it is, and it will. There are people in India right now who are being killed for their faith. There are pastors in India. The prime minister of India right now has said, this will be a Hindu nation, and there are pastors. And they say, I'm not going to raise my hand against them. The very next day, they're found dead in a ditch. That happened uh, June 7th. Six of them in the last couple of months have been killed in India. And they won't turn away from the gospel. They told their wives when they were taken away, they said, I'm not raising a hand 
and I am not turning away from the gospel. Next day, they're found dead. They're holding to the truth because they had been given to the Lord. They're no longer resisting God. They know the truth. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. And now, they're with him. Those men are now in heaven. They've left widows, they've left families behind, but now they're in heaven. But look at that again. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, summons him, and I will raise him up on the last day, unless the Father summons them. One of the ways it's described is a bucket thrown down in a well and the water is pulled up out of that. You're the water. God's got the bucket. What can you do? Just go in the bucket, right? That's all you can do. He draws you up. He summons you and you come. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, there it is again. Third time he says it. Truly, truly, truth of truth. Above this, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread and that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly. How many times does he have to say this? Truly, truly. That's the fourth time. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. There's the abiding. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who eats me He also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. So, Catholics practice the Mass from this text. Every time the Mass is served, Christ is crucified again on the cross. And they're actually eating his body and drinking his blood. Is that what Jesus meant here? No. He meant, because he said it, he said, abides in me in verse 56. He says, those who abide in me, those who commemorate, those who acknowledge their existence with me, those who acknowledge their union with me, then join into communion with me. We should have done a communion service off this text. When you take communion, you acknowledge the union which God has done. But God did this. But God put me in union with Christ. When I was yet a sinner, when I was dead in my sins and trespasses, God came into my life, opened my eyes, let me see who Jesus was. Let me see that he is the true bread that came down out of heaven. Let me see that his blood paid for my sins. Let me see that the illustration there that he's drawing is that I would abide in him because he's put me in union with him and now I have communion with God each and every day and I need to stop resisting his grace by sinning. I need to see that that's a resistance, that he had to break that resistance, and he did. And if he did that, and I could not do it, what do I do then in response? If I couldn't do something, and God did it, what is our response? How should we respond to God? You couldn't do it. He did it for you. What do you say? This is where you say, thank you. You guys weren't ready for that. Sorry. All you can do is say thank you. All you can do is say thank you. At Christmas, how many of you guys opened up presents and then paid the individual 100 bucks for what they gave you? Oh, this was way too much. You shouldn't have bought this for me. Here's $100 offset the cost. Would you have done that? No. This is one of those old evangelism explosion illustrations, right? You would never give someone something to offset the cost of it. That's what our works are like when we think we can work to pay God back for some of those things. So he goes through this, this dissertation with these guys. You can't see this. You can't understand this unless the Father does this for you. Verse 59, let me just finish this chapter. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? And they left. 
But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then, if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. One of the issues that we have when, I, when we teach election, or we teach irresistible grace, when we teach these truths of Scripture, people say, why doesn't God save everybody? Couldn't God save everybody? Couldn't we be universalists? Yes. But there are some who still reject him. Well, wait a minute. If you teach election this way, isn't it true that unless God has saved him before the foundations of the world, they can't come to him? You're going to have to take this up with God. I don't have an answer for you. Why didn't he save everybody? He could have. There's a punishment still yet to be paid. We we're all condemned. He saved us as firebrands from a fire. He pulled us out. All we can do is say, glory be to God, and live in such a way that we proclaim those truths. He might be saving one of those people who's rejecting him right now. Look at Paul. But God saved Paul, a mass murderer. Does it get any worse than that? Paul was, by all rights, a mass murderer. He was killing people. He saved him. For Jesus knew from the beginning, finishing off verse 64, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. He repeats it time and time again. I didn't count how many times he says that. He says, the Father must break your resistance. Are you thankful this morning that God has broke your resistance? Now let me ask you a question. Are there anybody, is there anybody here who God hasn't done that for? Do you see the person and work of Christ? Do you see what he's done? He says he'll raise you up on the last day through his death, burial, and resurrection. But God, but God saved us. Let's go back to Ephesians. Do we understand this truth? If you haven't understood this truth this morning, oh, that you would. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In kindness he has done this. He's done this because of his mercy and his love. While we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By his great grace, he has saved us. Oh, that you would understand that this morning, that God saves through his grace. That you would come to him this morning if you haven't. And you would understand that. Where is Paul drawing from some of our understanding here? The transgressions, the deadness that we had before. Turn with me back to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. I wanted to talk to you just briefly about what Paul understood about the law and where we find God's grace and compassion. Turn with me to Exodus 34. Moses has smashed two sets of the the tablets. The first law came down. What did he do with it? He threw it upon that idol. He destroyed it because they were out doing what? Iniquity. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. The people of Israel were out on the, at the foot of the mountain, even while there was a thunder on the top of the mountain, even when God's presence was with Moses, they couldn't wait any longer. Have you ever been in that situation where you have a hard time waiting for God to answer or do something? They couldn't wait any longer, so they started doing their own thing down at the bottom. Moses comes down, throws the first two tablets at them. And here is God now saying, I'm going to make this covenant again. Behold, I'm going to make a covenant with these people again. I'm going to make my covenant because it's between me and them. In verse, 30, or verse 1 of 34, he says this. Now the Lord said to Moses, cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. Verse 2. So be ready by morning and come out in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds not, may not graze in front of the mountain. This seems very severe. This is a beautiful picture of what people view God. They view God as very severe. You can't even come close to him. You can't approach him. He says, don't even have anybody, even the cows grazing around that. Because if they touch the mountain, they'll die. That's how they see God. It's like, even if I come and touch this, God will kill me. God is wrathful. God is an angry God. He needs to be appeased. Have you ever heard that from people? Verse four. 
So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed, verse 6, then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God. He's about to rewrite the law. Look what he, how, how the Lord refers to himself. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Paul isn't pulling this out of the air. Paul is saying, this is the God of the Old Testament. This is the God who gave us the law. Wow, think about that for a minute. When people say, I don't want to become a Christian because you Christians tell me I can't do this, I can't do this, I want to live my life as my own. Say, God gave us the law because he's compassionate and he's gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. He keeps loving kindness for thousands who who forgive iniquity who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. If you don't come to him, he will not leave you unpunished. Why doesn't God save all? Because some still reject him. He can't leave them unpunished. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations, Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship He said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are so obstinate and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your own possession. Do you want to have God make a covenant with you? The idea of hesed is in this. The idea of hesed, a faithful covenant-keeping God. Have you ever heard that term used for God, that he is faithful? His hesed? The word has said is his faithfulness. He's faithful to the covenant which he's making to them. Well, wait a minute. This is about the law. Okay, so is there a paradox here? He said he's doing this out of his compassion and his love and his loving kindness. You're thinking, the law doesn't seem very loving. How many of you think that the law is loving? Anybody think the law is loving? Nobody's raising their hand. How many of you think that the law is loving? I have one person in my wife because, oh, some of you are thinking, wait a minute, I got to change my answer because he's pushing the issue. Yeah, I am. I'm pushing the issue because I'm about to take you to Paul, right? You're going to turn to Galatians 3, 23 and 24 in a minute and see why God is compassionate to give you the law. Why is God compassionate and loving kindness? Why is his his said, his faithful covenant keeping nature, his mercy and his love, his mercy and his love are overflowing each other in giving us the law? Because what did Paul say about the law? Turn with me quickly to Galatians. I'll say, I'm going to preach to you the entire Bible today. I have a mother-in-law who says, can you just not preach the entire Bible? I said, no, I can't do that. I got to do the whole Bible. Turn to Galatians 3. Verse 23 says, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law. That's how people see themselves, being under custody, being in a prison cell, being under custody. Do you feel like you're in in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed Oh, wait a minute. There's something to come. There's something, a mystery, something to come out of the, out of the law. There, verse 24. Therefore, the law has become our tutor, our pedagogos, our one who takes us to school to lead us to Christ. Wait a minute. Back up. Did you guys see that? What's the law used for? To bring you to Christ. Should we study the law? Should we know the law? Yes, because it tells us we can't do something, but God does. You were once under kept custody, under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor, our, our guide to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ were clothed, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. There are, you are, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. That's where we're knit and bound into this. That's where we come into that. But the law is our tutor as our guide. But God being rich in mercy. Back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God being rich in mercy gave us the law. 
Because of his great love with which he loved us, he showed us our need for a savior, that we were under custody and only God could break our resistance. We resisted God. We were enemies of God. We rebelled against God. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. Even when. Kai, so it ties it back up to and you again. So the word that's the Greek word used there in the beginning of verse five ties it back up to and you were dead in your trespasses. Even when you were dead in your transgressions, you were alive and you were a rebel to God. You were a rebel to Christ. You were a rebel to the gospel. He made us alive together with Christ. How many of you would go to, onto a battlefield and do this very same thing? How many would you go over to the enemy and say, hey, I'm gonna send my son to die for you. I'm gonna send your son because you're my rebels and you're my enemies. I'm gonna send my son. He's gonna die for you and then we're gonna have peace. He's gonna be the peace child. By grace you have been saved. How many of you have parentheses around that? Paul is so excited about God's grace that he interrupts the flow of thought. If you don't have parentheses there, the only reason the parentheses are there is because Paul is so excited. He wants to get to verse eight. He wants to show you that it's God's grace, but he has to say this and it's interrupting the flow of thought. That's why there's parentheses there. If you have parentheses, he's saying, by grace, by God's grace, you've been saved. He can't hold himself back. Can we? Can we hold ourselves back and not proclaim God's grace? Paul has been holding himself back. He wants to get to the grace of God. For by grace you have been saved, but he, he has to put these other things there. Made us alive together with Christ and raised us up. It should have been the flow of thought. But he says, by grace you have been saved. He's forgiven you your transgressions. He came to you when you were an enemy. And he will raise you up and raise us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus This is a picture of not only his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, and his seat now at the right hand of God Almighty. We understand this as his resurrection, his ascension, and his session. Now, he has a unique position sitting at the right hand of God. But when Paul is saying this, we understand that he's not only talking about the resurrection, he's talking that one day we will ascend and we will be seated with him. Session is a word of being seated in judgment. And so we join him and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Again, it's in Christ. So that in the ages to come, so that was the past. In one through three was the past. The present is four, five, and six. And now in seven, he says, for this purpose. This is the purpose clause. This is the application. So that. So that what? so that you exist for something, so that you are going to exist for this purpose. Here is the purpose clause. How many of you like to have a job description when you get a job? It says, this is what you do. This is your purpose. This is what you're gonna do today. Here's the job description. So that in the ages to come, some would say this is just the age of the Ephesians. I say no, this is future, future, future. This is the waves on the beach. This is the future of what the church is called to do until Christ returns and then throughout all of eternity. You guys want to know what your job description is for all of eternity? Here it comes. So that in the ages to come, into eternity, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You are to be a demonstration of the grace of God. You are to be a picture, a billboard of the grace of God. You are to be a trophy of God's grace. However you want to do that, However you want to do that. I cut my ear yesterday and now I'm a trophy of God's grace with a band-aid on my ear. Is that okay? If you guys want to dress up, you can dress up. How do we present ourselves? How do you demonstrate the grace of God? Anybody have an idea about that? How did I say it at the beginning of the service? At the beginning of the service I said, we ascribe to God the strength. We ascribe to God. We say, God did it. But God saved me. But God does it. But God created the earth. But God breathed life into me. I am in the image and likeness of God. God did it. All you have to do is think, how do I give glory to God? God did it. That's pretty simple. But God. Like I said, we need to get the t-shirts. But God. And then dot, dot, dot. And then you just fill it in. How do I give glory to God? Ascribe to him what he's done. The power, the majesty. What has God done? While we're yet sinners, he saved us by his grace, by his mercy, by his love. Why did he give us the law? To lead us to Christ. Why should we proclaim the the law? Oh, because we're a bunch of Bible thumpers. You need to obey. Turn or burn. Sorry, that's a bad term too. Turn or burn. Really? 
No, out of his grace, God gave us the law to show us our need for a savior. Our need is Jesus Christ. If you haven't acknowledged Christ as your savior, oh, that you would contemplate, ponder the things I just said, that you would say, I need a savior. Look at the law. The law is perfection. And what did the Israelites do? They said, we can do it. 30 seconds later, they couldn't do it. They're a good, a good example. And they are, by Paul's, ex, Paul uses them as an example. He says, they're an example. Look at the nation Israel. They thought they could do it, and they couldn't do it. In John 6, they thought, what do we need to do to inherit eternal life? What do we need to do? What are the works of God? Believe in the Son. Abide in the Son. But God did it all. But God proclaimed his greatness. The apostles' thoughts in 4 through 7 has gone full circle. He began by speaking of God's mercy and love and the motivation of his initiative in saving his people in verse 4. Then Paul drew the reader's attention to the mighty rescue which arose out of God's gracious action in verse 5. And he concludes by declaring that God's lavishing his mercy on rebels is to serve as a demonstration of his grace for all succeeding ages. That's where we get the idea of into infinity, into eternal life. What God has done for those in Christ is a reality, but only in the coming ages will it be fully seen for what it is. In the light of God's gracious saving work, believers point men and women from themselves from us to the one to whom they owe their salvation. You give glory to God by pointing to the salvation. That was from Peter O'Brien. I thought that was a profound way to think about this. When people look at you, you point them to God. When you want to know how to glorify God, I'm going to work at my job. I'm going to do whatever I can do to give him credit for it. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. How do you do that? Say, God did it, but God I really think we should get some t-shirts. But God, but God. And people go, what does that mean? Oh, come over here. But God saved me. Do you know the Apostle Paul? But God knocked him off his horse. But God. We point people to Christ. We point them to Christ. What is it about you? It's about Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the patience of your people and the and long articulate things, Lord, that uh, we've drawn out this morning. So many areas to think about, so much to ponder, Lord. I pray that your people would be patient with me, Lord, and all that I threw at them this morning. But, Lord, that we would rightly understand. To give you glory is to acknowledge that you did it. You did it. We couldn't have done it. That gives you glory. That gives you praise and honor. There's nothing we can do. No way we can pay you back. All we can do is say thank you. Thank you for what you've done. May we make the proclamation. May we ponder this in our hearts and may we praise you at all times. So Father, bless your people in this. Please grant them patience, Lord, with me uh, and all that I threw at them, please. And may they be, Father, tools in your hand this day to proclaim the excellencies of Christ. I ask your blessing in Jesus' name, amen.